you can sign it on, 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 online, or you can fill out the form, print it off, sign it, scan it, and send it in. And it won't be onerous. A lot of the work, like I say, has already been done already with your uh, membership application, your citizenship application. So Craig's gonna talk a little bit about now about the, uh, the next steps now going forward on how, where we're at with the application forms and the application process, and then we'll take questions. Good day, I'm Craig Latender. I'm the harvesting coordinator at the provincial office. Um, as Bruce said, uh, it's been a long process to get where we are right now. We, um, we are very close. The burning question is, you know, when is the application going to be ready? Uh, when we first started this, when we signed the agreement in, in uh, March, uh, we were starting from ground zero. We had to build the application. We had to put all the processes in place. Um, so it's, it's definitely take us, taken us some significant time. Uh, but we're really close. We're, you know, within a week uh, to two weeks to being able to accept applications. And that's kind of where we're at right now. With the application, uh, the process is going to be as such. You'll, you'll be able to place your app, put your application in. Either you'll be able to go into the, you know, regional offices um, and place your application there. They'll have copies or, or online uh, applications as well. Um, you'll be able to come into the provincial office or, or just print it off and, and email it back to us. Uh, it's a very simple application. The question, one of the questions we go, why do we have to put another application in? Basically, it's just information that we have to have on file that shows the government that, you know, this is a, a harvester who wants to harvest and, you know, all their all their information will connect back to your to your family tree. Um, the process is going to take approximately. We have it narrowed down to about four weeks, best case, um, four to six weeks. So by the time you fill out the application, uh, we get the registry to pull all your family tree information. Uh, we send that to uh, No History. Uh, they determine from their algorithms uh, which areas you'd be able to harvest. And it comes back to us. We send in for a card, which, by the way, it, it's, uh, it was always discussed that it was going to be uh, a sticker. Uh, we've since uh, revised that. and It's going to be a new card. So on the back of the card, it'll say something to the effect of approved harvester for, and the areas that you'd be approved for um, for, for harvesting. The, um, once you, like I said, once you put the application in, it, it's, it's going to be a fairly, fairly uh, uh, simple process. Um, the uh, areas that you would connect to would, as Bruce mentioned, will be all based on your ancestral connection uh, to the areas. Um, another question that we've had is that uh, there's a lot of people that have uh, harvesting letters from the government. Uh, what happens to them? So they will be uh, grandfathered in. Uh, you'll be able to continue harvesting uh, with your letter. Uh, they, as of September 1st, you'll be grandfathered into the, the new area. So let's say it's Lac St. Anne, which is in Area D. You'll be approved under the uh, government uh, letter for Area D. Uh, and they're going to be sending out letters to that effect. Um, however, one of the benefits that it's, uh, that's going to be beneficial for, for citizens to, to come and apply uh, through the MNA is that under our process, you could very well uh, qualify for more than one area. Uh, we've sent some test cases in, and of them test cases, approximately 80% of them came back um, stating that they were approved, they would be approved for all four areas. So that's one of the benefits uh, to, to go through the application process uh, with the MNA. Um, that is not going to happen with uh, with the government letter. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of harvesting in a nutshell where we're at uh, right now. Um, I'm going to be around uh, the trade booth all day today and tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions or if you think of something, grab my card. You can send me an email or uh, give me a call. 
Um, my mall is accessible, one call away kind of kind of thing. So, yeah, thanks. So I just want to kind of add some context to that as well. So you will get a new card, but it'll be your same Métis number. That won't change. All that's going to change is on the back of your card, instead of a sticker that can be taken off and put on, we're going to be embedding your harvesting areas on that card. And plus, there'll be a signature box on that card as well if you decide to sign it. Hopefully, at some point in the future, those cards will be considered like identification. And I just kind of want to explain the process now for the application. So once you fill out the application, this is how long it takes us. Like Craig says, we've been testing this. So if we send in your application on a Monday, by that Friday, we will get back your harvesting areas that you can harvest in. And then the following Monday, we order you a new card and we get that card back by that Friday. So that's two weeks. At the end of that two weeks, the following Monday, that's when it goes into Canada Post. And so we've given two weeks for that process, for the Canada Post process. So theoretically, from the time you apply to the time you get your card should be four to five to six weeks. It should be a short turnaround time. And like Craig said, you can apply at the regions, you could apply online, plus there'll be engagements that we'll be doing as well, targeting specific areas, attending local events, regional events. Uh, and so that's how we want to get this all turned around so we can have as many people signed up by September 1st. And so when he talks about that grandfathering letter, that's the old policy. So just because you have that doesn't mean you automatically qualify to harvest under the, our Métis Nation of Alberta process. You still have to apply for that, right? So the, for the folks that are Métis that, that are not part of the MNA, they will still be able to utilize the Government of Alberta process. But the Government of Alberta process is not a dot on a map either, right? It's these regional rights-bearing areas. So they're going to use this as well, right? There's no more letters saying you can harvest 100 kilometers or 160 kilometers around this area. What it's going to say is you can harvest an area A, B, C, or D. Now, that's for the government. Now for us, when we, now we get back, one of the ways that we have to look at conservation, and let's just say there's things that happen and you get stopped by a fish and wildlife officer, how can he confirm that this is legit, that this card that you give him is legit? Well, one of the things we're working on, and it's similar to a driver's license, when you get stopped on the highway by a city police or an RCMP, they ask for your driver's license and they go into their system and they type it in and Alberta Registry kicks out, yes, this guy has a valid driver's license. Well, that's something similar to what we're gonna do with the GOA. They have this system called Realms. So m and will be responsible for inputting your harvesting areas. You will be responsible for everything else, your, your personal information, your address, if you have to change your, and whatnot. And what that's gonna allow is if you're out there harvesting, and the fish and wildlife guy comes up to you and says, hey, are you, what are you doing? And you say, I'm harvesting, here's my card. He'll take your card, he'll go to his system, and he'll just put in your number, and it'll spit out, yes, this person can harvest in these areas, right? That's one of the ways that we're gonna look to police. So anyway, I gotta wrap it up right away. Any questions? All right, thanks a lot, uh, Bruce and Craig. We got uh, a question there from uh, Mr. Browning on the microphone. Um, but before, before we go that, I, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank both these gentlemen. Uh, this harvesting policy um, took a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of negotiation. Uh, they were part of it, of course, our president, and, and uh, was, she was part of it as well. And uh, so i just like, before we get into questions, can you guys just give them a big round of applause in, in getting this work done? Have you got this mic? Oh, there we are. We got her. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Aaron. Uh, I don't know if I'm standing too close to the mic. My name is Ken Browning. I'm from Region 6. I was born and raised in Lake St. Anne. I belong to the Latender and Belcourt clan. But I have to make a comment on what was just said about harvesting. In uh, my region, I'm out of my region where I live in Rycroft. I work close with the fish and wildlife there with uh, Norman Backer. And although they know I'm out of my region, they still come and get me to take care of problem animals with the, within the farmers. 
So I, I have to differ with the gentleman what they said about my letter being no good. I think my letter is good all over the province. I fish all over, I hunt all over, the RCMP don't give me no bad time, nor does the fish and wildlife. And I got a question, uh, uh, I appreciate what uh, the two gentlemen have done in Métis Harvested. However, three years ago I was nominated to that uh, committee by uh, President Sylvia Johnson at the time, and uh, Ms. Quintel never did contact me to attend any meetings to get any comments from me. I am one of the top harvesters in this province. I hunt, I fish, my deep freeze is full of wild meat, fish, I pick berries, I can berries, I do all kinds of things as a harvester. And then uh, recently, Carol Ridsdale gave me a letter appointing me back to the same committee that I was supposed to sit on and uh, I sent a copy to Mr. Latender, who is a relative of mine, I don't think he knows that, but uh, uh, never did I get a call to go sit on this committee to make any comments, and I was wondering who put this process all together when people like myself were appointed to sit on the committee and give recommendations as active harvesters, never had a chance to even get a phone call, and. What happened to that system? Who put this all together? Was it just a couple of guys by themselves or did they get any recommendations throughout the province? I recently, uh, a couple of months ago, met with President Poitras and discussed this with President Poitras, but I uh, didn't get a very... Uh, I, she responded to me by letter, but it did clearly state exactly what happened to the process. So did you guys actually have a committee to get recommendations from? or? Do, who put this together? So, sir, uh, good question. Uh, and the committee you're referring to was the Harvesting imp uh, uh, Advisory Committee that we had put together while we were negotiating the harvesting policy. And you'll remember that the committee actually got to meet several times to discuss that. And so when we finalized the harvesting policy, that meant that the work of that committee was done. And so you will probably maybe have received a letter from President Patra thanking you for your service. And now going forward, though, Ex one excuse of the me, that excuse we're, we're me, that's, be... that, that, that's not true. At no time did I ever receive a call to take a part in, in this process. I never ever received a call from anybody. That's yeah. the question I'm asking. Yeah, I'm so, not challenging President Poitras because so, I support her and I always have. Okay. So uh, what yeah. you're doing is you're giving me lip service and you're talking around my question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Next question. Hi, Bruce. Who's next? You are. Thank you. I'm Louis Bellarose. Can you hear me? From Peace River Country. I hunt, I hunt and fish for a living. And uh, this new deal with the government First of all, I'm going to complain about uh, the noise in here. I couldn't hear half of what Bruce said and nothing of what the other guy said for economic development. But uh, maybe just see a technician so uh, the sound could be adjusted better. Thank you. The, uh, the new deal that's called the fishing harvesting for the Métis Nation is very confusing at this time. It was such a good deal when they let us fish and hunt for our, for our Métis people. But one thing is uh, wrong. And that's been partially fixed over, the, uh, over this last uh, new contract. We set a net to get enough to feed 100 families in one night, where the other people with the hook can only go home with one fish. So when I fished, I used the net. And when I got home, there'd be four or five fish cops there. Four times they came to my place because the neighbors phoned them. Oh, Louis got another box of fish. So they sent somebody. Finally, I got tired of it. 
I said I just retired as a Métis and I might make my living uh, fishing just about all my, most of my life. And you're sending these guys here to check on me all the time because the neighbors phoned them. And uh, I dealt with Neil Brown, one of the head biologists in the peace country, the head guy. Because I'm young guys, I told them, you could come in here unless you bring, the, you bring your boss or you bring that son of a bitch that's always phoning you. I want him standing right beside you. His face got red and he did send Neil, <laughs> the boss. So Neil, I said, you know, you're the head guy for fishing here in this country with the government. I want to make one thing straight. I said, I want to give my relatives fish. Can you stop me? Lewis, he said, I know. I know you're doing good. I said, he said, you're fishing within the law. He said, you could fish. By this time, I'm kind of pissed off at him, eh? And he says to me, feed all your relatives how much fish they want. And I said, mister, you got darn right I will feed all my relatives. All 38,000 cousins in eight settlements. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> His face kind of turned red, and he said, okay, Lewis, and he walked away. That was the last conversation I had with him. So I just thought I'd tell you what I'm doing up there. I'm fishing whenever my fridge is empty. I fill it up. One of my rich cousins, my friends, gave me a deep freeze, just about a brand new one. It's not full, but it, it will be full when I get home for you guys to come and eat fish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, maybe the microphones and the sound system is an issue. We do have the booth over there. Please go and, and ask some questions if they weren't answered for the presentation. Uh, Mike Ivey, you're next. Joe Dupereau, Mike Ivey, Afi Togasan. I thought Mike quit smoking. Who here drives a black Jeep Patriot? Your door that's broken keeps opening in the wind and people are scared someone's gonna break into your car and steal all your stuff. There was a pack of cigarettes in there, apparently Andrea. No, I'm just kidding. But if you uh, have the black Jeep Patriot or you know somebody that does, can you tell them their door is open? Good morning, everybody. I'm sure you can hear me. And uh, it's really good to be here. I, I felt ill the last couple of days, and I just hated the idea of not, uh, not making it to the, our annual assembly because it's like a big family uh, reunion, right? 
it's a lot of fun, and uh, so I'm really glad to be here. And, and to my right is Joe, who you met earlier, who um, presented on the economic development strategy, which I know it's hard to see and hear and understand in this room, but I have to tell you that Joe's put a lot of work uh, into it. Uh, we, uh, there's a steering committee that's involved in, in helping Joe and, there's, and, and Trevor. And, and um, uh, um, so you're going to learn more about that strategy as it goes on. I can tell you that there's no other region in the country that's put this kind of work at a sort of a grassroots level. So um, you're really going to start to see the benefits of, uh, there's already people in this room that I've seen that said, I want to get a copy of his presentation. So um, anyway, I, I want to talk briefly about Apitogasin for its last year's operations. Uh, we don't have a slideshow or anything like that. It's just me and Joe. And Joe sits on our board. We have a board of six, three of which are from Region 3, uh, and two are from Region 4. And uh, this is, that, that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, last year's lending was okay. It wasn't great. There was a 25% decline in overall lending. We usually do close to four million. We were three and a half million in total loans. Uh, but in terms of operating um, solvency and financial condition, uh, we made a net income after tax of just over 500,000. In fact, I think it's actually a bit more than that. It's actually a bit more than that. So uh, we maintained our loan portfolio of 7.5 million, despite the fact that we had a decline in loan uh, growth. And if you were to ask me, well, where did the loan, uh, where did the decline come from? I would have to tell you that it just, it really came from uncertainty last year when we didn't have a, um, we weren't sure what the government was wanting to do. We weren't sure what kind of government we were gonna, we were gonna have. And clients were very, um, quite often they would say, you know what, I just wanna wait. I wanna wait until I feel more confident about the economy before I pull the trigger. That was really the theme of last year. So, um, but at the same time when I say that, our clients' repayability, we always forecast about a 4% decline, or sorry, 4% loan loss. We came in under 1%. So uh, our clients continue to uh, persevere even through difficult times. Um, we just recently renewed our relationship with Rupert's Land, and this kind of speaks to um, the um, economic development strategy that Joe and Trevor have been working on, where AMD has a really solid relationship with Rupert's Land. Uh, and um, so we have that education component, with the workshops that we do in all the regions like Calgary and Edmonton and Lethbridge and, and Medicine Hat and so on. Um, all those workshops are supported by Rupert's Land. And so we have a really uh, tight relationship with that organization and I think it's only going to get broader and tighter as this economic development strategy becomes uh, implemented. So those that's things from 30,000 feet. If you have any questions about um, you know our operations, we have a we have uh, we still deliver the grant program for from the uh, federal government. So if you're a, if you're an individual that's say looking to establish a business that costs a hundred thousand dollars, you're you're um, eligible for about a forty thousand dollar contribution to support that initiative. So um, it's, it's still never there's never been a better time for Métis to get into business than now, if you were thinking about it. Um, we just uh, recently got a bump to our allocation. We used to only get about 1.1 million in, in federal funding for the Métis entrepreneurs. Now it's about 1.4 million. 
So we have more grant dollars to provide Métis entrepreneurs than ever before. And um, that's about it, eh, Joe? You know, like, uh, if, if anybody's got any questions, what's that? Oh, yeah, hold on. Joe wants to say something. Good morning again. Um, <clears throat> when I joined the Abbey de Gosan board, that was uh, almost three years ago now, and I really didn't know what to expect, right? I didn't know a lot about the company, about the affiliate and what it does. And so since that time, I've been um, on, on several committees. One in particular is the loans committee. So I get to see a lot of the loans that come through. And what I see in the loans that come through is that there's a lot of innovation um, and a lot of inspiration, right? And when you think about entrepreneurship, those are two really important factors, right? Is to be inspired and to be innovative. So it's just a, I encourage you to think about, you know, what you have in front of you and, and in terms of opportunities, like they're, they're may, they may be there, but it just takes some, some effort to really think about what you might have in front of you in terms of opportunities. But I would say to people, um, don't, don't be scared of be becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, once you succeed as an entrepreneur, you'll never go back because it's, it's a lot of fun. I've been, I've been self-employed since 2001. And when I became self-employed, it was a pretty scary first step. But uh, once you make that step, it's, it's very, very uh, meaningful and rewarding. So I encourage you to think about what you might do when it comes to starting your own business. All right. So, uh, and just to get behind that, it, Apitogason's mandate just isn't to provide financing. That's a big part of it but it's not the only part of it. Our other job is the business counseling. And let me give you an example of what makes Apitogason different from everybody else. And when I mean everybody else, I mean everybody else. I was in the Royal Bank the other day. I had to, I had to get some, I had to do some, I had to engage a teller, right? And and I, I, as I'm standing in line, I'm seeing, you know, they got that big screen, oh, meet Mrs. Tang, she's our mortgage specialist. Meet this person, they're our mortgage specialist. But there was nothing about small business and entrepreneurship. And I asked them about that and they said, you know, we really aren't, we're not trained, we're not, we're not skilled in that area. The Schedule A banks, the Schedule B banks, do not offer any kind of business support, business training, business advice, business counseling at all with respect to entrepreneurship. So we like to think of ourselves as, as not only having that niche, but we own that niche. We really do. And, and um, so I, I like to, I actually like to hammer that as much as I do the commercial financing, the money part. The money part is, that's the easy part. The hard part of getting a business up and running is the, all the developmental, the business planning, the business support, making sure you file your T2s, your T4s, and all that. All that work, Amdi accommodates for you. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize that in addition to, you know, the available capital that, that's available to you. So anyway, that's our show here. So if you have any questions, Speak now or forever hold your peace. I'm going to be here for the next two days, so you can come and see me out in the trade show if you, you know, you want to talk to me about an idea or whatever. And um, so if you don't want to talk to me here, you can talk to me in there. Or you can talk to me outside or at supper or whatever. Anyway, so that's it. All right, thanks a lot, fellas. Uh, great presentation. Um, you know, every time I hear uh, Mike talk about our lending institution, um, it gets better. And, and I think a lot of people, and part of what we need to do when we come to assemblies is pass it on, right? When you go home, talk to your, your kids, talk to your, uh, your relatives, let them know what's available for Métis citizens. And we have the best Indigenous lending institution in the country. That's simple. And uh, if you need to borrow money, 
to start a business or grow your business, that's where you need to go. It's that simple. And um, there's also all kinds of loan supports that they provide, business planning. You might have a great idea. You might have an idea in the back of your head. Maybe that will make you millions. But you need help getting a business plan or whatever. These are the guys you need to come talk to. All right. So, all right. One, uh, no questions. I don't see anybody at the mic. We're going to get into our housing presentation. I'm actually going to give the housing presentation um, next. If you can throw my PowerPoint up, please. All right. So. Métis Urban Housing, Métis Capital Housing, um, we're the largest Indigenous owned housing company in the country. With that being said, with that being said, we're only just barely touching the needs, the housing needs of our people. Um, one of the things in the nation that is an issue with programs and services and lots of the programs and services you'll hear about today, tomorrow, and, and potentially on Sunday is we have all these awesome things we're doing. But one of the, one of the problems though is there's 114,000 Métis in Alberta, right? And so when you look at something, yeah, we're the largest indigenous owned and operated housing company. We got a thousand houses. We got 114,000 people and we got huge waiting lists. But today I'm going to talk about our current state, talk about our board, our leadership, what we're doing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of this new stuff that's going to be coming on to help more and more and more people. And one of the things I know with our nation is that when you help one person or one family, there's a big time ripple effect, right? And, and, and so, you know, you might help one family get that leg up or that hand up. And then their kids benefit and their grandkids. And, and so that's what we're all about is that, that ripple effect. The MA, as you know, is the shareholder of Metis Urban Housing Corporation and Metis Capital Housing Corporation. We're governed by a board with representatives from each of our six regions. Region one, representative. And if you're here, stand up, give a wave. Maybe we'll clap a little bit. Well, because we do need to recognize our board. I've been working with this board for about four years, and we've transitioned this company from where we almost lost it to a point where we're the national best practice. So from Region 1, Brenda Burke Stratichuk, that's our rep. Are you here, Brenda? She's back. She's at the pawn shops. Region 2, Isabel Mishnuk. Region three, Jeanette Hansen, give her a hand. Thank you, thank you Jeanette for all your, your work. And you, you, just so you guys know, these are volunteer positions. This is a volunteer position where they have two board meetings every single month. And Jeanette drives all the way from, from Medicine Hat to Edmonton and takes up her personal time for two board meetings every month. Doreen Patra Hayes, region four. Solomon OJ, where are you, Solomon? I seen you this morning. Here he is, folks. Benita Galandi from Region 6, where is she? Oh, there she is, right front and center. And of course, our beloved president, Audrey Patra, she's the chair. Oh, there's Doreen. Hi, Doreen, I didn't see you. MUHC was created back in uh, uh, November 26, 1982. And our goal and what we do is provide affordable, adequate, suitable housing to low to moderate income Indigenous families. Métis Urban Housing has 505 units in 14 urban centres that we operated under the Urban Native Housing Program and it's currently funded through Alberta Seniors in Housing in the uh, Ministry of the Government of Alberta. It's important to, to understand Métis Urban Housing because we get a lot of questions. Why aren't you in rural, more rural areas? You have to understand we took on this program from the Government of Canada back in 1982. We didn't have control over where we, the houses were that we took on. We just took on the portfolio and we've operated the best we could since 1982. 
505 houses, they were initially funded through transfers from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and now they're funded by the government of Alberta. Um, these financial transfers allow for low to moderate in, uh, income Indigenous families to have subsidized rental rates. And under Métis Urban Housing, uh, it's for low income families, and your rent is never more than 25% of your income. So um, that provides these families with affordable housing, and they're able to thrive in the community. The bulk of the houses are in Edmonton and Calgary, plus three, 12 smaller communities across Alberta. Since tw 2015, um, we've completed over 300 renovations. That's a lot of work. We've renovated almost every single house in our portfolio since 2015. I'm going to show some, some pictures on the screen of before and afters. This is the before, <coughs> after. So quite, a, quite an improvement. Another before and after. Uh, before, after. Before after Mike Mike Ivy uh, when he did his presentation from uh, from Appy he talked about the economy uh, you know the economy does play a role in our demand for subsidized housing but it also doesn't play a role there's always a need for subsidized housing for our people our people have big families a lot of times you support grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and it's, oh, got to get my notes going here. It, and it's, affordable housing is the backbone to, for a lot of us to be able to do that. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is over time, our waiting list grows and grows and grows. So for Métis Urban Housing, this is one of our two housing companies, we have over 1,330 individual applicants waiting for subsidized housing. The interesting thing about our subsidized housing and getting on the waiting list, it's interesting and it's sad. To get on the waiting list, you have to qualify to be in our subsidized housing. So you have to be low income, you have to have a family, but you also can't already be in subsidized housing. And we don't just count our waiting list in applicants, we count it by family size. And so we have almost 6,000 individuals in our families waiting for subsidized housing that qualify for subsidized housing that are not in subsidized housing. So what does this tell us? What does this picture tell us? It tells us they're living in poverty right now. They're couch surfing. They're paying a ton of money in rent. And so we do the best we can with what we have to get our houses renovated and get families in there, but there's just not enough subsidized housing it's in the province. A key, a key focus of our board uh, has been having a good working relationship with our funders, enabling us to do renovations and place more families in homes. As a result of this, we've been able to take action on two things that are very important to our corporation and tenants. So with our 505 subsidized housing, this isn't a forever thing. The way Canada set it up is that we will lose the subsidy. And in fact, we were supposed to lose the subsidy. But through Audrey, our president and our chairperson and our board, they fought and I fought, we were able to extend our subsidy till 2023. That's a huge achievement. That's not that means we're not displacing 505 families into poverty because we would have to charge more than 25% of their income. So I think for our board members here, I think that's a big achievement. We should give them a little bit of a round of applause and appreciation for that because that's huge. What that extension on subsidy has provided is provided time for Audrey, the board, myself to negotiate these subsidies into perpetuity. So we're right now starting to sit down, we're beginning, we got four years, it sounds like a long time, but it's not, just ask the politicians in this room. Four years goes real quick when you go back to your elections. It provides us with time to negotiate this subsidy so we don't lose it for our families. One of the issues, one of the issues that Métis Urban Housing has faced is chronic underfunding. You know, 
this has resulted in our houses falling into a state of disrepair. And I know some of you are living in communities where you know where our houses are. Some of them are in a disrepair. That's not due to poor management. That's not due to bad governance by our board. That's because every year we have to put a budget into the government of Alberta and they will only allow us to renovate so many homes a year. It's just, it, it hasn't been right. When the board and I started to, to work through this issue of underfunding, we actually went back right from the beginning of time and calculated what the adequate level of funding needed to be on these homes. It was a ton of work. We fought with government. They ignored us. Many of you know we're going to talk about our, our, our journey to self-government and where we're at this afternoon. Part of that journey is claims against the Crown, claims against the Government of Canada, claims against Crown corporations such as Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. We took that, as, uh, we took that agreement that Audrey signed, our framework agreement, Métis Urban, Métis Capital Housing, what we did immediately is we set up a table to negotiate and settle the chronic underfunding going back to 1982. People thought we were crazy, people thought we were never going to get the money we asked for. And I'm very, very happy to report that we actually, the first claim against the Crown, we settled it. We settled it in full. That Canada has agreed to pay us $60 million to go to establish our reserve fund. Our reserve fund, our reserve fund isn't something that you know, provides ultimate flexibility and all these things. A reserve fund is this. A reserve fund is attached to each one of our homes. And every time, what we're supposed to, what Canada was supposed to do is provide us funding annually so that when the roof broke, broke in or the door broke or the water heater or whatever went, that this fund was there. This fund was never there. So we settled it. We have a $60 million fund to take care of our homes. And I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Audrey and our board for their support in getting that done. This was the first claim settled against the Crown. What we're doing right now is we're undertaking planning, strategic development that no affordable housing company has ever done in this country. We're building a comprehensive maintenance program because what we're going to do, we're going to change how subsidized housing is done in this country. It's interesting that in able to do that, you need the money. But we we promised each other at the board and at the staff level, we're not going to just waste this money. This money is going to be used strategically, and we're the board approved the, the maintenance and the maintenance strategy um, yesterday. We've also, another success is uh, we've conducted energy efficiencies on 235 of our homes and we've installed solar panels on our head office and other properties across the province. Métis Capital Housing was established in 2007. We have 354 units in five urban centres. The M&A, just like Métis Urban Housing, is the shareholder of Métis Capital and the board of directors that I introduced is the same board. And we meet monthly. I never heard of a volunteer board meeting monthly except this board and I just, I love the commitment that we have from our board to do things and it's really going to show. People know the new resources have come in and I want to thank everybody for your patience because there's going to be some awesome stuff rolling out in the fall. A main focus is our affordable rents program. We have 187 homes across the province that we own. There's no mortgage, there's no funding from government, there's no anything but and we could rent those houses out for whatever we want market rent whatever but as a nation under our leadership we decided we're going to take 20 to 30 percent less than every landlord in the in the in the province we rent these houses out for 20 percent to 30 percent below market value there's 187 of course there's a big waiting list there's 187 that's lots of homes but it's not enough we're going to need to build some more we have an awesome program called our Family Reunification Program. And we refer to it as FRP. And it's dedicated to reuniting our parents and their mothers and fathers and their children by providing placements for up to three years. By reuniting, I mean 
You know our, our children that end up in social services, they end up in care, they end up in foster homes and because their parents can't take care of them? What we do is when the parents are ready, the mom, the dad, usually the mom, when they're ready, when they're sober, when they've gone for treatment, when, they, when they're ready to take their kids back, we bring them into this awesome apartment building we have in Edmonton and we provide them with all the supports they need. Some of our, some of our families have never cooked a healthy meal believe it or not. And we help them, we teach them. And after three years, they move into one of our houses. Our success rate is just is eight, uh, 79%. 79% of these parents, after the time we spend with them, we provide them with all the support they need. By the end, they're completely independent. They do everything on their own. It's the most wonderful thing. And they move in and their children are integrated back into the schools. They're integrated, they're healthy, they're happy, loving families. We pr this program, we, we uh, participate in the crime-free multi-housing unit uh, program in Edmonton. We provide 24-hour support to the families as they need it. You gotta understand, these are some big families. These kids, they participate in sports. We have drivers, we have vans. The moms, they participate in community groups, activities. They, some of them go to ADAC, some of them go to AA, some go to NA. We do every single thing we can in the beginning to make sure we help transition them to help happy, healthy, loving families. Parenting skills development. Um, employment and education planning. Mentorship. Building self-esteem and knowing that these families can, see, can, can, can succeed is one of the, our biggest priorities in this program. When they know they can go out into the world and they can walk by one of their triggers or one of their old bad habits and succeed and go get their groceries and go participate, it makes them so much more successful. So we really do work with them on building self-esteem, confidence, and providing role models for the children. We also have our Seniors Lodge. It's 40 units, it's assisted living, it's in Edmonton. We provide meals, laundry, and cleaning to our residents. Um, the rent we charge, is much lower than most of the senior lodges in Edmonton, so it provides for our low-income families, our, our low-income seniors. We also have the uh, Boyle Renaissance Tower. It's a 90-unit apartment building for seniors and people with disabilities, 31-bedroom, barrier-free. 31-bedroom, barrier-free units and 62-bedroom suites. Um, we also, in this building, a lot of you have heard about people that need to come to Edmonton and get uh, medical treatment for maybe they're going to cross cancer, maybe they need dialysis, maybe they need all these things. We provide um, accommodations for them free of charge in this building. So if you know people that have to come to Edmonton to go to the hospital or go see a doctor, get in touch with the MA and we'll put you up in, in one of our, our units in this place. Um, again, with this, we charge eight, nine hundred bucks a month rent. We decide to do that. We take less than all the other landlords in town. Um, that's just something we do for the community. We provide the free housing for medical. We also have, um, we also have commercial space in this building. And it's interesting and it, it paints a picture for us. We put this up for lease, we, we, you know, under past leadership, they wanted to sell it, we said no. And you know why we do, I'll tell you why. You have no control over who your tenants are. You think we want a liquor store or a bottle depot in our building? Absolutely not, a pawn shop, forget it. So we, f we held tight to our guns and we've leased out this space and I'm very proud of the people we leased it to. We leased it out to a family doctor. We leased it out to a pharmacy. We leased it out to a convenience store. And the one I'm the most proud of, we leased it out to the Boyle Macaulay Dental Clinic. The Boyle Macaulay Dental Clinic, for those of you that need dental service that are low income or your seniors, they'll do it there for free. So our seniors in that building, they have access to free dental. That's a huge success for us. We have one little bay left. We have one little bay left. And we're, gonna, we're making money now on this building. We're breaking, or not make, we're breaking even, which is all our goal is. 
We have one little bay left and we're waiting for the, another perfect tenant to, to take that spot. New initiatives. We're, as I mentioned, we're working on our asset management plan to guide decision making. We've been very actively involved with the provincial and federal government in the development of housing strategies. Provincially, the government of Alberta launched an affordable housing program. Under Métis Capital Housing, like I said, we have no government support uh, for the bulk of it. We choose to rent out below market. We had 10 homes that were completely uninhabitable. And in the past, what would happen with those homes is they would just get rid of them, they'd sell them. But Audrey said, no more, we're not selling unless there's no other option for redevelopment. And so we held on to them, we boarded them up. And just before the last provincial election, we got a letter of commitment that as long as we put that land up, and these are big lots in old mature neighborhoods, as long as we put the land up, the government of Alberta is gonna give us six and a half million dollars to turn those 10 units into 20 units, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. So that's gonna be starting here soon to that redevelopment. Federally, one of the things with the federal government, there's lots of good things, there's lots of controversy, but one of the things that I really do appreciate is they're willing to negotiate nation to nation, government to government with the Métis Nation. One of the things I don't appreciate is we signed a $500 million housing accord nationally. That's for all the Métis governments from BC to Ontario. We signed it, the federal government announces it, they promote it, it gets out there. We gotta wait two years till we get the money. We, well, they announce it, they celebrate it, we gotta wait two years to get the money. That cr creates a big headache for us because we have, we, like I said before, we have almost a thousand houses, we got 114,000 Métis, we got lots of people that need homes. They go and announce it, but they don't give us the money for two years, it creates all this false expectations and all this, this discussion in the community, what's going on, what's going on. Well, we're building it, but we're waiting. We have to wait till we get the money. We never just do anything in the, the M&A. We never do anything ad hoc. We never do it without planning. And so we've now hired a person. We have some of the resources in. So we're designing and developing six very, very important programs. To the t this is gonna be a $12 million a year initiative for the next 10 years. New affordable housing development and acquisition. On the books right now, we have about $10 million that we're going to be designing and developing housing. Our board really wants to prioritize housing, affordable housing for seniors. We have in the past um, done some planning in Medicine Hat, in Grand Prairie, other places where we have programs that have been successful that we're gonna look at, we're gonna model those, we're gonna build them, and we're going to be moving around. It's gonna take time, we have to be patient. We're gonna move around region to region, year by year, we're gonna do program projects all over the province. We're gonna start in the areas where we know we have partners. So for example, one of the things that you'll hear Rupert Slan talk about or you'll hear Audrey talk about is we always, always look for partners. So for example, I'll use it, this table right here. Medicine Hat, City of Medicine Hat, they, they've given us land, the land is there, free land to build. Grand Prairie, Angie, she's got land again for another elders caring shelter. That's the type of stuff when we can maximize our limited funds. So that's the new housing development acquisition. Down payment assistance program, this is serious. Down payment assistance program means we're looking at, we, because mortgage rules have changed, we're not 100%, we're doing the analysis right now, probably between 20 to $30,000 for our people that can qualify for a mortgage that don't have the money for a down payment so they can get into home ownership. This is gonna be big. A reserve fund, you heard me talk about that $60 million problem in that settlement. We know part of what we need to do is plan, is plan for 
redevelopment for repairs and all these things. So we are going to establish a reserve fund. This reserve fund doesn't just go in our general account. It's a fund that the board and our finance team set up that is external to our, our, us. There is rules on what it takes to access the fund. You, it has to be for, it has to be in an in, a risk-free interest-bearing account. We actually hold a lot of clout with the bank now. We can tell them, no, 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 we don't want 0.1%. We want 1%, we want 2%. We, we earn the interest. We put the money there for the repairs of our homes. A home repair program. A lot of times our people that get into home ownership can't afford to do the upkeep. So we're starting a grant program for home repairs. <coughs> Again, we're gonna look at it from different angles. We're gonna look at it for our disabled. <coughs> we're gonna look at it for our seniors. We're gonna look at it for our families. And there's gonna be different paths to the application process. Emergency home repair program. This is different than the grant program. This is, this is for us to help our people that are in really dire straits. I've worked with Audrey for 10 years and I can tell you every winter she gets phone calls. And we're talking about people that still use a, a stove to heat their home. We're talking about people that they don't have money sometimes or, or they're hurt or they're sick and they can't get firewood. And they're in a really bad spot. We've never had the resources to help them. This is for these families that something happens and it's an absolute emergency. And so we'll be formally announcing all these things coming up in the fall. I'm just talking about them today. And then the one I'm most happy about is our low income rental rent support program. So I gave you a snapshot, 6,000 individuals waiting on our waiting list for affordable housing that are living in poverty. This rental support program will help them. What's one of the barriers people have? Damage deposit. Getting your damage deposit. They might even be able to afford the rent, but they can't come up with two months rent right away. They need help with damage deposit. Or they can afford 800, 900, but the rent's 1400. So this will help top it up. It'll also help us with our 187 homes that we rent out below market when we run into issues with families there that can't afford. <coughs> so I would say the housing, the future for housing is looking awesome, looking great. Um, I know people have heard the federal government talk about these new programs, heard me talk about these programs in community meetings. And I would say thank you for your patience, it's coming. Believe me, it's coming. I promise it's coming. This isn't a dream. The money's there, but we need to design and build the programs by Métis for Métis. So if there's any questions, please go to the microphone. I'm happy to answer Lewis's question right away. Thank you. Thank you, Alden. Very good. Very good information. Thank you very much. Mr. Chiefs, you are to the Manoma housing. I'm going to talk about housing. When it first started 62 years ago, there was no housing for Metis. Meetings in Payat Onigani or Kipamotito up north. Leaders were going around talking about they're going to build houses for us up north. And our people, still to this day, when you have a meeting, our people don't say nothing in a house or in a room. All their ideas are outside when they go for a smoke. The best ideas in the world. This one time when they were talking about building houses for us, in a house, in a meeting in a house, going to build your houses. Tate we be a capacity got seen who is a you big squid. Oh, the meeting on was gonna see the maga we are. Kaki om si tastigi was gonna you go. Missy ogam go hot tastig. Oh, that's the capacity of the no. You go kick a team now at the Mitsuo, get you this. What's our dogs going to eat? It's 
supposed to be a joke, you guys. All right, uh, Ken, you mind if we let the lady go first on this side over here? Thank you. I just want to know, how do we change the really bad, bad policy of elders who all of a sudden become widows and are kicked out of their housing because they're now single? That policy needs to change. <laughs> We have housing for seniors and the, you know our, our Boyle Renaissance Tower for example it's there's lots of widows in, in there one of the issues with our subsidized housing is we don't we don't create the rules on, on the Métis urban housing we have to follow the rules um, of the urban native housing program so I'm not going to speak specifically to widows or specifically, but when we see a house that's overcrowded, for example, when there's too many people living in there, we have to, we have to take action. We have to tell them, okay, some of these people need to move out. Maybe your kids are over 18. They need to leave or if you want to keep, or we have to ask, we have to give them a 90 day notice to evict on an overhaul, overhaul, uh, on housing where uh, it's designed, uh, say it's a three bedroom or a four bedroom, and we have 1,300 families waiting. We're bound by the rules that we have to provide them a 90 day eviction under urban housing, because that's the government rule, so that the family, the next family waiting gets it. Under Metis Capital Housing, that's the one where we choose the 187 or a Boyle Renaissance Tower, our Seniors Lodge, our family reunification. We would never evict somebody because they're a widow, because we create the rules. So I, I hope that that answers it. We have under Métis Urban Housing, the rules of, in, of, how, of how we do things is set by government. Okay, that's what needs to change is the urban housing. Not, not all of our seniors live in Edmonton and they don't have access to the yeah. facility. We, we're stuck with, and, and I'm sorry, but as my husband built a house, the native urban housing house next door sat empty with the windows wide open and yet there's people living in the streets. Something needs to change, some policies need to change. We need to get in there and change the policies. We, we, we shouldn't be throwing our elders out on the streets. We don't throw anybody out on the street. They always get 90 days notice. And like I said, we have houses that are gonna be vacant and they're gonna be vacant for a while because you can see our, our budget's open, our work plans are open to anybody. We put it in. We know that house you're talking about. We've done analysis. We know exactly what it takes to get it rent ready. It might have asbestos issues. It might have mold issues that you don't see. We know what the budget is. It's at the whim of government. If they say to us, you're not fixing that house, we can't fix the house. We would want to fix it if we had the resources, but we don't always. Right. Now, with that being said, with the establishment of our replacement reserve and settling that, that's going to provide us with more opportunity to take initiative and look at a house and say, you know what, this one's worth putting some money into to get a family going. This one isn't. We're going to recycle the inventory, get something new. So I hope that helps. It's not a perfect situation. We do the best we can. Okay, because I'm, I'm just witnessing senior number two being no, I know. evicted. And, and what do you do with them? Being a landlord in affordable and subsidized housing isn't always an easy, rewarding job. It isn't. We have to make tough decisions. Okay, Mr. Browning, I know you got lots of questions and lots of experience. This guy did a lot of affordable housing across the prairies uh, for decades. I to, hello. I wanted to ask you about uh, when you said there was assistance for people that come to Edmonton, elders and whatnot that had a medical problem. There's a lady in my community, I don't know if she's Métis or Aboriginal or not, I didn't ask her, but Last November, she uh, underwent chemo. She had both her breasts removed with cancer, and right now she's in uh, taking radiation treatments, and she certainly could use some assistance, but would that still be available for a person like her if she was not Métis, if she was not Native? Can I, uh, I, I couldn't hear your, this, can people stop talking? As I couldn't hear your question. Like, it, it was muffled. Can you try it? Maybe talk out without, talk, can you talk without the mic maybe?
most powerful subject I think is definitely the raising of my children to Islam. You know, Alhamdulillah, for so many more are more progressed in the world to spread knowledge and help guide and make it very gracious to them. But I don't know if it's safe here or we're safe with this. He was a lovely person and he'll be able to be peace come with this. He's been down for a pretty rough time. So uh, Ken's talking about people that have to, seniors that have to move to town or travel to town for medical, right? So we have the, the suites at the Boyle Renaissance. Those are temporary, okay? Um, at the Boyle Renaissance, we have control. We, you know, we have a waiting list, but we can prioritize people based on needing to relocate for medical, for other reasons uh, in that building in Edmonton. We also have, an, uh, you can t learn more about it in the trade show with our, our health booth. We do provide transportation services for people, seniors in particular, but people tra need to travel. Uh, they need a, a ride or they can't, they're too sick to drive their car. We can help find them a driver and pay the driver mileage to bring them into town for their, their medical. But people just need, and that's why I'm saying these, these meetings are really important because we're, we don't get all 40,000 Métis Nation of Alberta citizens but I bet you everybody here has 100 relatives they can talk to and let them know, hey, you're coming to town, you, need, you should call the MA. They're gonna, they have a spot to put you up at the Boyle Renaissance Tower while you get cancer treatment. Oh, by the way, you need a ride to Edmonton? This, the MA has a program to pay somebody gas, mileage, meals, whatever, to bring you into town for your treatment. So pass that word along, we do have it. For people that are currently residing in town, I think you're using a specific example, what they can do if they're looking for an uh, affordable home, they can get a hold of our housing department or if they're here, they can talk to the booth and uh, get, get on the list and get, uh, do the application for the Boyle Renaissance Tower in Edmonton or our Nigai Seniors Lodge. She, she could apply for some sincerity even if she was uh, non-native. I'm, I'm not sure if she's Métis or not. Oh, if they're not Métis. Yeah, they're, if they're not Métis, they're probably out of luck, unfortunately for the programs. However, if they're First Nations, we do allow some First Nations to live in some of our, in some of our homes when there's vacancy and there's not a Métis priority waiting for it. So they can, if they're First Nations and there's not a Métis person already in front of them, they can, they can access the Thank the you. Hi, Aaron. Hey. I just gotta say thank you for all your hard work. Like, wow. Um, my concern, I'm from Region 1, Corianne Morin. Um, my concern is the seniors in Lac La Biche. Um, there's a few, and I, I'm not going to name names, that I go and feed on a daily basis. They live in a hotel, and sometimes they live in the women's shelter. And they're on fixed incomes, so there's not really much in our region that offers any kind of assistance for low-income housing. Well, there is some housing, but they're all full. Um, but the elders are my real big concern, especially the ones that are living in hotels and homeless shelters. Yeah. And I realize after hearing all these beautiful things, it's not really going, it's not coming to our region, and we want to know what would we need to do to get some of that brought to our regions as well, so then we can meet the needs of these ones in, in the region, because it, it, it's kind of sad to sit there and watch them struggle when they're on fixed incomes, and sometimes they don't even have food. Yeah. Poverty, poverty in, is an issue. Yeah. It's an issue in Lac La Biche. It's an issue in all the communities. Um, I know there's some land in Lac La Biche, Audrey's been engaging, Brenda has been engaging on to try and find some land and, and, and then get some resources. As far as people living in, in hotels and, and in poverty, um, one of the things that we can provide right away is, and I'm sure, I don't know, Corianne, you know we have Métis resource workers in the head office. I would tell you when you visit with these people and you help take care of them, tell them to call a re one of our resource workers. You never know. It's, it, there may be something they can link them up with or help them with, okay? As far as something immediately to take people out of, out of hotels in Lac La Biche, there's nothing. Yeah. 
we know we have, I think, what's the number of subsidized homes in Lakowit? 22 or 12? There's some, but they're full, and there's some waiting to be renovated, and there's waiting lists. Um, but again, we have, we actually have a Lakalta Lodge that was uh, closed down, and you never know, that thing could be for sale, and I think the Métis Nation of Alberta should swoop in there and take over and buy it. And yeah. not only that, they should buy the Labishin too, because that would be revenue. We can make that one into one Métis Nation region, make it into Rupert's Land, Métis Housing, Métis Children's Services, and have our Métis Regional in that office. And not only that, we'd be able to put a Tim Hortons in there, which would pay <laughs> the revenue. <laughs> now you're talking. Well, I'm talking revenue, and <laughs> this is something our leaders should be doing right now, because I had planned this before elections, but I didn't get in, so mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it up to the ones that were voted in, because they're not, they're doing other things, but for me, this was my idea, and I said this even way before elections, we should buy the Lakelta Lodge for the seniors, and that Lac La Biche in, because those guys are going under. Nobody even goes there for coffee. Coffee's too cheap, too expensive, and nobody even wants to work for them because they don't pay. Uh oh. So That's I think the Métis Nation should swoop in there, buy it, make it our own because it is script land, and that would be our historical, ancestral connection to the land. Great ideas, thank you, Corian. The one thing, the other thing I would just say, when you're, again, when you're meeting with. Tell them for, to talk, to get in touch with the resource workers. The other thing, help them or have the resource worker help them apply, get on the list for housing. Okay. Because they need to get on that list, right? Like okay. It, and, and, and then they're at least in the queue and when something does come up, they'll be able to, to access, okay? Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Are there any more questions? Great, I love questions. All right, up next. Juanita Marwa, where are you? You're going to be talking about the awesome stuff we're doing at Métis Crossing. Oh, I have a couple announcements. What, do you, what is that? There's some papers. I don't know what. Anyways, he's going to come and tell me. All right, uh, do you have a blue Dodge plate uh, M59895? A blue Dodge. Move your truck, please. You're blocking our caterers. People aren't going to be able to eat. You're not going to be a very, very popular person come lunch. Uh, also, another Blue Dodge Caliber, Caliber BYV 6772. You're blocking the road. You're not going to be very popular either if you don't move your car. All right, thanks. Oh yeah, okay. They're, they go to the trade show, I'll go drop them off for you. Oh, speaking of contests, sorry, I was told I need to announce. Um, contest one, uh, there's a TV and sound bar comp competition or prize. Uh, go to Rupert Sign Institute booth and you can uh, enter the draw to win a TV. Uh -huh. uh, contest two, a one year subscription to Xbox. I'm just looking around. Doesn't seem like there's many Xboxers here. They're probably up in the youth conference. And uh, another one is uh, just open to youth is the actual Xbox video game console. That's open to the youth. So go to the Rupert Slam booth. If you don't want an Xbox, put your grandkid or your kid's name on it. They'll, they'd happily enjoy it. All right, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? I'll hold this down. We're queuing up the presentation on Métis Crossing. I'll start by letting you know that Métis Crossing does have a trade show booth. If you want to see some more pictures, talk about the programming we have, please join us in the trade show booth there. We have a fabulous team of interpreters this year who are doing a great job bringing our culture to life. Next week, this is in your program, we also have some great posters around. Next weekend is our biggest annual event, so we have Voyageur Days at Métis Crossing. We have our trappers tents, our campground waiting for you to arrive. We'll have cultural programming, jigging contests, 
fiddle contest, entertainment on the stage, and all sorts of other things. So I really encourage you to come out there. This is our place, and you'll love it. All right, so my report. Like Apitagosan, like Métis Urban Housing, Métis Crossing is an affiliate of the nation. The Métis Nation of Alberta are our shareholders, and we are governed and directed by a board of directors. Our board of directors, our chairperson is President Audrey Patra. We also have Vice President Dan Cardinal, Region 2 President Dwayne Zaraska, and two amazing volunteers. Our knowledge holder is Art Cunningham out of Region 3. And we also have Andy Popko, who brings us invaluable guidance in the corporate world and in how to develop a prosperous business, which is a theme we've heard over and over here today. So those folks, they're not here in the room right now, but they will be for the rest of the weekend. Please thank them. They are amazing. Our mission, Métis Crossing is a major initiative of the Métis Nation of Alberta. It will be the premier center for Alberta Métis cultural interpretation, education, gatherings, and business development. And I have to stop and say that we will not only be the lead Métis attraction, but we are going to be the iconic indigenous attraction for the north part of the province. There is nothing like Métis crossing out there. We have 512 acres, and this land is designed to engage and excite visitors. We, our programming will encourage active participation of, of visitors and activities promoting an appreciation of our people, our customs, and our celebrations. We have four main goals through Métis Crossing. The first is to share our Métis story with all people. The second is to be a gathering place for our Métis nation. The third is to achieve financial self-sustainability so that our direction is not guided by government programs, it's guided by what we want to do. And thirdly, or fourthly, we want to minimize capital debt while we're doing it. As many of you probably know, in 2005, we celebrated Centennial opening. Métis Crossing has been a dream of this nation for decades. The first president to talk about this gathering place was President Larry DeMille. In 2001, our leadership decided to take a dream and make it a reality, and they purchased our land. In 2005, we opened our centennial opening, which was a $3.2 million investment. And what we did here is we restored our historic buildings. So we have Métis homesteads from the 1860s to the 1880s, and we have two that are restored there. One is the Sinclair, and one is the Cromarty. And we have great oral histories of Ben Sinclair getting into his wagon and fiddling down Victoria Trail. And that was the indication to all the visitors, all the residents, that you need to come to the Cromarty Barn and dance. It was a Métis dance place. And that's what we recreated. So we, we restored those homesteads, the barn and the outbuildings. We had a heritage village. So actually that picture there is great because it shows the Cromarty homestead when we bought the property. And it shows the same homestead now that's an active programming space. We have nature trails and a playground, a stage and a campground. But we all knew that wasn't enough. We all knew that Métis Crossing needed more. So from 2005, 2008 to 2014, our leadership continued to look for a way to enhance Métis Crossing. And in, in 2017, finally, we received a Building Canada fund. We have 3.5 million infrastructure dollars from the Government of Canada to start the process. That wasn't even quite half, but it got us started. We got an additional million from the, from the government of Alberta. We've been building on that ever since with additional corporate dollars and child, early learning and child care. With that money, we started looking at what does more look like for Métis Crossing, and we created some project objectives with the board of directors. So the first one was that construction would provide opportunities for Métis citizens and contractors. Our second project objective was that the bid process would be fair and open and transparent. 
The third was that the facility would be designed to maximize operational and energy efficiencies. The fourth was to instill a strong sense of Métis pride and presence. And the last project objective was that we would provide not only seasonal operations, but year-round opportunities for people to come to Métis Crossing. With that, our design process began and we worked for about eight months with Manask Isaac Architects to design a facility. It is not a museum where you will go look at old things behind glass. What we created was a place in which experiences will occur. So this is the out, these are the uh, renderings of the outside of the building. This is one of our potential floor plans. So in there we have a gift shop where you will find no moccasins made in China. Everything will be authentic Indigenous art, and we're actually working with a group uh, out of Lac-la-Biche, it's the Alberta Indigenous Arts Cooperative, so that we can support our Indigenous artists and bring their work to market. We have a beautiful stone fireplace that mimics what you would find in a traditional Métis home, around which we can gather and we can do the storytelling. All of us know that Métis parties happen in the kitchen, so even though there is a gorgeous commercial kitchen behind the scene, we have an open Métis kitchen where people can gather around a beautiful log table and we can share our stories and we can learn our crafts. So this is one potential layout. This is another potential layout. And you can see this one holds over 280 people at round tables. We can go up to 340 people seated at long rectangular tables. The really cool thing on the bottom left-hand corner is the Rupert Sand Center for Teaching and Learning classroom. So in there we have a classroom for 40 people and another for 20 people. We can open that up and create a space for 60 people. Extremely uh, open spaces that we can do many, many different things in. The diagonal piece that you see on the screen there, that is a gorgeous deck overlooking the North Saskatchewan River that almost doubles the capacity that we can serve. So there's space out there for another 200 people. So if you're sitting in an assembly like this and you want to go outside and watch the river and listen to it, we have it wired so we can live broadcast whatever happens inside the assembly outside onto that deck. Our tender process was pretty cool. So our objective was to maximize opportunities. So once we had our, our tender documents prepared, we went out, it was an invited bid process. So before the bid process, we reached out to all of our regions and we said, do you know of any good ghetto contractors that can take on a project like this? We invited seven. Of those seven, we actually received complete bid packages from four and then we rated them based on this criteria. So 20% of the rating was based on organizational, capa organizational capacity to do a project like this. 20% was scored on the actual team that they assigned to this project. 40% was based on price. And 20% was based on Métis content. It was very important for us that we operationalize that objective. In September 2018, the Board of Directors signed a contract with Genmec ACL. For those of you in this region, you probably know Genmec is a local contractor. They are doing amazing work, and we can't be more pleased. Construction started in September 2018. The Métis content is important to us. Genmec has, by March 31st, so this report looks at that fiscal year, by March 31st, GenMEC had reported over 2,300 person hours of Métis employment directly through GenMEC. We also engaged Métis subtrades and suppliers. So we have Carvel Electric, we have Big Ray Dume. Does anyone recognize that? There you go, right there. And Lac La Biche Building Product supplies our wood products as well. So it's an active process for us to engage our Métis contractors. But that's just a space. Now, what, what are we going to do there? So that process is really important to us as well, and we've engaged in what we call an experiential interpretive and de design process. So what we want to do at Métis Crossing is not tell you about Métis people. We want to engage, inspire, and delight people about who we are. And I'm not talking just Albertans. We're talking international people from around the world. We want to engage your head, your heart, 
your hands and your hunger while you're at Métis Crossing. And we want to talk about the Métis in the past, the present, and the future. We are a living nation. This isn't about our past. Thank you. We started that process with two basic questions. What do we want people to know about the Métis when they leave Métis Crossing? But not only what do we want them to know, what do we want them to feel about the Métis Crossing? We've had some difficult stories. There are some pretty uh, jaded stories about our history. We want to clarify those and we want to change people's worldviews. Some of the major themes, or the major themes that we've come up with, are becoming a nation. That is something we have to let people know about. Relations and family. Can you walk into a Métis person's home and not make all the connections of how you know each other? We are based on family. Creative expressions, our dance, our music, our art forms, our writing. We want people to know about economic life and entrepreneurship. We've heard that over and over today. We want to talk about our relationships of the Métis people to the land and to the water. And we want to also acknowledge our spiritual life and belief systems. So all of that design leads us into a partnership with Rupert's Land Institute. And I have to acknowledge the amazing work that Rupert's Land has done with us. We work with them on developing curriculum-based field trips, on professional development for the teachers, and land-based learning. Now, I know this report is only supposed to talk about up until March 31st, but I have to tell you, we had over 1,000 students come through Métis Crossing this June, which was amazing for us. It's great. We talked about things like Tales of the Trap Line. So I, we talked about being a year-round destination for the first time in February. We offered a program called Tales of the Trap Line. How many of you remember that this was the coldest February in over 40 years? We brought 140 students from Elk Island School Division out to the crossing. We took them snowshoeing. We taught them survival skills. And we taught them about trapping. They loved it. They loved it, and even the teachers loved it, which was great. We built that interpretive plan into another program called Paddle into the Past, where we talk about Métis trapping history. We put them in the water, and it's a very different lesson for students and for adults to talk about a voyageur and say, yeah, they were little people about five foot three, they carried 90 pound things on their head, you got into the water and they had to paddle 50 strokes a minute. And then we put the kids in the water and we put them upstream and we make them try to paddle 50 strokes a minute. And then we tell them to look at the bank and they realize they haven't moved. And that's a great learning opportunity. Then we turn them around and we float them down to Victoria Settlement. Financial self-sustainability is critical to us. But I've been directed by the board not only to find a plan that allows Métis Crossing to survive, but also to thrive and to drive the tourism economy in Northeast Alberta, and that's what we're going to do. But we can't do that alone. We have to do that with partnerships. And we actually invited, we invited our neighbors, our partners, to a business development workshop in May. And it was amazing. We invited all sorts of people, and I thought, oh, you know, we'll get 10, 15 people. Over 30 representatives came to be a part of Métis Crossing. They came from government, they came from school districts, they came from post-secondary institutions. The entrepreneurs in the region were there, the travel trade was there, it was wonderful. And then we engaged Pinnacle Business Services. So Afi talks about how they help Métis businesses. They worked with us to develop a Métis business or a Métis Crossing business plan. Of critical importance in that business plan is the support of Métis citizens and Métis people and our affiliates and our ministries in supporting Métis Crossing. So when Api Tagosan and RLI have their entrepreneur workshops, we need to host some of them at Métis Crossing. Another example of that is we have been working very closely with our Métis Nation of Alberta Health and Youth Department. We've hosted the youth camps out at Métis Crossing, which have been fantastic. 
We worked with them to do things like put up these trappers tents at Métis Crossing. We worked with Métis Nation of Holdings, which was fantastic, and this is such a great story to share. So as we started being talked about in the Smoky Lake community, Métis Crossing is growing again. One of the elders in that region, and she's not Métis, she came to me and she said, Juanita, I need to talk to you. And her land was located directly north of ours. And she told me about how her father was adopted by the House family and taken in by the Métis families that lived along the Victoria settlement. And because of that, when she was 76 years old, she said, I can't take care of this land anymore. I want it to come back to the nation. And she didn't give it to us, but she sold us a quarter section of land for $40,000. That is far below market value. And she did it because she wanted that land to be a part of what we're doing. And the Métis people helped her family earlier. Another strategic partnership that we're working on is with the University of Alberta, their Native Studies program. So this is actually a class we did, Native Studies 404 or 504. And the students actually worked with me to develop interpretive programs for the crossing. They far exceeded all of my expectations. These students were engaged, they were intelligent, and they brought fantastic ideas. Marin, are you here? If you look through that door there, or through that glass window, Marin was one of the students. Their, their, their ideas were fantastic, and we're actually taking Marin's ideas of what they came up with last year, building on that to fully develop one of our interpretive trails out at Métis Crossing this year. Students bring us great ideas. The other partnership, obviously, that we need to have are our financial partners, and I need to acknowledge the members of the Threads of the Sash. So the government of Alberta has been very supportive of what we're doing. Pambana Pipelines contributed over $100,000. TC Energy is another one. The government of Alberta, or government of Canada, was absolutely foundational. We have more partners since March 31st, but these are the ones that were in place then. So I know I'm not supposed to show you what happens now, but does anyone want a sneak peek of our new building? So you saw the renderings, but this is where we are. So that's the interior of the building, beautiful log work throughout, and that big concrete pad you see in the middle is where the stone fireplace is gonna be. And this is the exterior of the building. You get an idea of the deck that's overlooking the North Saskatchewan River. It is phenomenal. So with that, I say thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear them. Everyone's favorite thing. All right, any questions? You know what? She lives and she breathes this project. It's been a long time coming. It's amazing. Uh, it's going to be a legitimate Métis tourist attraction. We're going to do all kinds of cool stuff out there. We're already doing stuff there on the land. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, you got to understand the work that she's put into this. So can we just give her one really big Métis round of applause, please? All right, our final presentation of the, of the morning and, to, and then we're gonna break for lunch and then get into self-government stuff, the really fun, exciting self-government stuff. I, our youth have been talking about it and working on it this morning. They're gonna join us again this afternoon, I believe, for, the, for that. Um, but up next, we have our, our folks from Rupert's Land Institute, uh, Métis Center of Excellence. Um, they can introduce themselves, but I'll give a special introduction to my, my friend, my colleague, mentor, Lauren Gladue. Chief Executive Officer, and I always like to tease him because uh, he's a Chief Executive Officer. I said, I thought there was no Chiefs in the Métis Nation, but uh, we got Lauren anyways. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay, good morning. Um, I'm Guido Contreras. My colleagues are going to be introducing themselves very shortly. I just wanted to let you know that our presentation initially was an hour long presentation. We're gonna ha have to condense it so that you can go for lunch. And uh, also, uh, initially we had uh, Minister uh, Lawrence Gervais to come in and, uh, and do the, the, the presentation speech, but he is unable to do it. 
In, uh, in his position, we have uh, Rupert Salan Institute uh, Board of Governors uh, member, Mark McCallum, and he's gonna be speaking on behalf of uh, Minister uh, Lawrence Gervais. Um, again, our presentation is gonna be a bit condensed. Uh, I remind you all before I leave the stage that you have um, a contest. There's three or four uh, big items in that contest, and one of them actually, we're gonna be ruffling two backpacks, RLI backpacks full of RLI goodies, and you have to answer two questions. You're gonna find them in our booth, two questions that are gonna come from this particular presentation. So when you have heard us, go and fill them up and get what you, uh, what you rightfully deserve. Thank you very much, and I'm gonna introduce now uh, my friend and colleague, uh, board member, um, Mark McCallum. Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of the uh, Board of Governors and our staff at Rupert's Land Institute, I bring you greetings and welcome you to the 91st AGA of the Métis Nation of Alberta. It is my pleasure as a member of the Board of Governors to present Rupert Lands Institute 2018-19 annual report to the community. Without getting into too much detail, I am pleased to say we have now concluded a long negotiation process toward the next round of Métis labor market uh, programming. At the end of March this year, we signed a 10-year labor market development agreement with the federal government valued at $170 million. Uh, the final stretch of negotiations took place over 12 months where the discussions took place under the Canada Métis Nation of Alberta framework agreement to advance reconciliation. As part of this, we negotiated the inclusion of the Alberta Métis Education and Training Strategy in our agreement with Canada. And during this process, we were recognized as having one of the highest levels of administrative capacity to deliver programs and services at the level of optimum capacity. This makes me proud because there are not too many agreements who have achieved this level of capacity and acknowledgement from the government of Canada. In anticipation of these and other developments, the Rupert's Land Board met in October last year to take stock, plan, and set strategic priorities for the upcoming potential for self-government and to ensure Rupert's Land's business objectives align with this path to self-government. In our planning, we established six priority areas, and although I do not want to get into detail in this intro about this, uh, the priorities, uh, you will find them in our annual report uh, which is distributed here today and will be available throughout the assembly. However, I do want to highlight uh, that we wholeheartedly embrace the concepts of lifelong learning and institutional development as the keys to RLI's future growth and support for the Métis community in years to come. This means, among other things, that RLI will go through a growth process in new programs and services, which our directors will present in the next few minutes. Uh, growth in this case means the feverish pace under which the MA and the MNC have been negotiating agreements with the Government of Canada, many of which will come to fruition as programs and services in the months ahead. An example of this would be the National Post-Secondary Education Strategy, which we will get into shortly. This new post-secondary strategy program uh, <clears throat> will form part of uh, the exciting areas of Rupert's Land's wraparound services as we move towards lifelong learning programs. I want to highlight very quickly some of the accomplishments from the past years. In education, we have created the Rupert's Land Centre for Teaching and Learning, or RCTL, and this centre will be developing and deploying the K-12 education mandate to our stakeholders in the years to come. As such, our K-12 staff have been busy developing professional resources for teachers and educators to use under the newly mandated teaching and leadership quality standards at Alberta Education. Under language revitalization, 
ROI was successful in accessing funds through the Provincial Language Revitalization Grant, which you will learn more about in this upcoming presentation. My main point is that Alberta Education recognized Rupert's Land Institute as a Métis authority on education and that it holds a legitimate mandate from the people. From the post -secondary, for post-secondary supports, we created or enhanced five endowments for post-secondary institutes over the past year and increases, this increases the total uh, number of post-secondary institutes to 17, including the long-standing goal of establishing an endowment at Medicine Hat College. In terms of existing endowments, I am pleased to report that 172 Métis students received Métis scholarship awards from these endowments alone. Separate from this, it's important to emphasize that our online program under Métis Training to Employment invests in final year college and university students, and in the past year, this has amounted to over $4 million. When added to the post-secondary supports under the endowments, our overall investment is reaching $5 million per year for post-secondary students. As you know, our, our training mandate has been around since 1996, and we have been reporting on its success since then, which is well over two decades. Suffice to say that from these humble beginnings, this program is considered one of the best practices in the country, and this is why we are recognized as having optimal capacity. The new shining star in our on, is our online program, which is quick and effective for final year students. The required growth of the online program speaks to the community's willingness to access online services and shows the huge growth of Métis enrollment in post-secondary education. I will not talk too much about Métis training to employment results because I know that Sharon Sodchuk will uh, talk about them in a moment. Um, but I do want to take this uh, chance to thank our regional staff and acknowledge uh, their contributions. Uh, this has not gone unnoticed in the community. Uh, to turn briefly now to research, I want to say that two different approaches to research. We have two different approaches to research. One uh, that is program-based research, which generally means it is internal to Rupert's land, where we conduct quality research to support the development of policies, programs, and service, services. This includes the extensive analysis on the economy and its impacts on labor market programming, and where we need to invest our limited resources in employment partnerships and training projects. The second area of research, by and large, is held through a partnership with the University of Alberta, where we have the Rupert's Land Center for Métis Research. The Rupert's Land Center for Métis Research, or RCMR, is where academic research <laughs> takes place. Aside from research, the RCMR is involved in Métis community interests and delivers conferences like Daniel's and Métis Script, which were live streamed on the net. Plus, the RCMR regularly holds Métis Talks, which are designed to allow forums for scholarly and artistic presentations. I hope you will all agree that research is the cornerstone for Métis development as it builds empowerment in the Métis community is, and is essential to nation building. In closing, again I want to thank our board and RLI staff for their dedication and commitment and I want to encourage you to read our annual reports and hopefully you can participate in our annual draw for a big screen TV. I am now inviting our staff uh, to present more on our RLI's services. Uh, please feel free to bring any questions you may have forward. Um, I have two of our associate directors here today, Lisa Crookshank and S Sharon Sotchuk, uh, to give you a PowerPoint presentation that will follow my comments. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Crookshank, and I'm the Associate Director for Métis Education. And I'm here this morning to speak to you a little bit about the education mandate. Can you all hear me okay out there? Yes? Okay. All right. 
So I want to speak about our K-12 work that we've been working on for the last few years. And the really important thing to know about our resources that we're creating is that they are being created by Métis educators, which has never really been done before here in Alberta. So you're probably wondering, um, when Mark mentioned the Rupert Centre for Teaching and Learning, what that is. It was designed and set up so that we could help all our teachers deliver Métis education in their classrooms. So why are we doing this? A few years ago, we had say in the new teaching quality standard. And like any profession, teaching um, has professional practice standards. So as of this fall, all teachers will have to adhere to six competencies. So these competencies are things that teachers really need to be able to know and do and practice uh, throughout, their, throughout their school days. One of the competencies solely focuses on applying foundational knowledge in First Nation, Métis, and, edu and Inuit education. So of course we're focusing solely on the Métis part. It's also important to know that as we progress uh, through this work, we realize that Métis education actually permeates throughout all six competencies, not just that one. So with the help and guidance of our Alberta Métis Education Council, I want to put a shout out to Yvonne Patraprat, Dr. Yvonne Patraprat. So do you want to just stand up, Yvonne, and give everybody a, a wave? So she's just going to love me, I know, for doing that. And so Yvonne was one of our original AMEC members. Um, I also want to put a shout out to Linda Burgess, if she's here in the room. Oh, here she is. Okay, everybody, uh, oh, stand up, Linda. Nobody saw you. <laughs> okay, so Linda is here from uh, the Alberta Education Ministry, and she is the manager for strategy and system supports branch for the First Nation Métis Inuit Directorate. And we wouldn't be able to do this work without the support from Alberta Education. So it really means a lot to us that you're here with us today, Linda. Thank you. So with the support from our Alberta Métis Education Council, in the beginning days, um, there was a lot of work, a lot of brainstorming and dedication to come up with how are we going to help and support teachers. And that work included coming up with different themes about Métis. And so you might notice the flower image um, on the right here. And basically, the AMA came up with different themes. So one of them is lang languages of Métis. The next one is cultures and traditions, homeland history, Métis in Alberta, and Métis governance and recognition. And so those themes, we are creating resources. Um, our education team, they are developing the content and curriculum for those themes, all from research that has been done by Métis scholars. So all that's being compiled and we will create our lesson plans and classroom learning tools based on all that information. So if you go to our website, we are now on the website under the K-12 tab that you see on the side there. And there's four main areas that you can navigate through. The first one is the home page, which actually shows the themes. You'll be able to click on those and read a little bit about that. The next one is our resources page, which includes lesson plans for um, K-12, to all grades. Also, there will be immediate implements that teachers can just click on and bring up onto their smart boards. One example is last year for May T Week, we created an uh, interactive poster. So sometimes, um, you know, teachers need things right away, and we're really working hard to provide them the tools to do that. The next really important piece to Rupert Sand Center for Teaching and Learning is the professional development that we offer. And so we know that teachers are often learning right alongside the students right now because they really have never had the opportunity to learn really about Métis identity and our true history. Um, teachers are nervous uh, and scared. They don't want to ever say the wrong thing. So it's really important to, uh, to give them that support um, by us as the education authority. So things like preparing for the new, T new TQS, um, li Métis literacy and language, all those sorts of workshops are available. Sometimes a school has specific needs, so we can design our workshops based on what they need. 
Okay. So another question that we get from our community members is, for example, our three children are in elementary school. As parents, how do we know that their teachers are delivering Métis content? That's an excellent question. Um, just so you know, since the last or the current program of studies was created, there has been Métis content throughout different grades for the last number of years. One example is in grade four, people, teachers teach about Alberta, but the problem is, is there's never really been really specific Métis resources to help support those teachers delivering about the Métis. And like Juanita said in her presentation, we are a living nation. We're not just all about the past. And that's where we're really working hard to help people know that. Another example is in grade seven. In grade seven, you learn about pre-confederation, post-confederation. You learn about Louis Riel, and it basically stops there until you get to high school and you speak about imperialism and nationalism. But again, there's not a lot of things to support teachers. So one other question and last one that I'll end on for K-12 is what can you do as parents or grandparents to support your children at school? And so being an educator myself, it really always meant a lot to me when parents would approach me and say, you know, I know you guys are going to be doing Alberta. Is there anything I can do to help um, about the, you know, talking about Métis culture? So I think moving forward, it's always really good to just remember that your positive relationships with your students' teachers really put a positive impact on your child. Um, for example, we had a parent call us a couple months ago and she wanted to go in and, and teach about Métis uh, in her kid's school. And she asked us, what, what do you have? You know, I wanna make sure I'm saying the right thing. So all we did was direct her to our website and she pulled up our interactive poster. So we're here to help support not only teachers but also our parents and families. So our, one of our knowledge keepers, Norma Spicer, sums it up beautifully with her quote saying that the beautiful memories you instill in children today will impact them the rest of their lives. All right, so I'm gonna just turn over to Métis Education Foundation. And if you look on your tables, there's a beautiful brochure along with our annual report that uh, one of our Métis entrepreneurs, Rob Sachek, created. And it really sums up nicely all the great work um, that the Métis Education Foundation is doing. All right, so another question is, did you know that we created endowments at, at various post-secondary institutes across Alberta? These investments are dispersed to Métis students as Métis Scholar Awards. So you're probably wondering, how do you access these Métis Scholar Awards? So in order to access these, you, um, it's important that you understand they were created in partnership with the post-secondary partners, and the endowment investment and the awards are administered directly by each post-secondary partner. So that's really important to know. Students must apply directly to the post-secondary institute that they are attending, because each post-secondary institute has different application processes, application deadlines, different criteria, and of course, different um, award values. So the award values vary across each post-secondary institute. So that's really why it's important to contact them um, and, and find out the specific information on the awards. Some values, for example, range from $1,500 all the way up to $20,000, depending on which um, place your child is going to go. So you're probably wondering, well, where and which ones, which ones are there? So basically, right now, we have um, endowments and Métis Scholar Awards offered at 17 um, different post-secondaries across Alberta. So that's pretty huge. Um, they're all listed there in that beautiful graphic. Right now, we're in negotiation with three additional partnerships, which include Keanu College, Red Deer College, and Olds College. Right now, the opportunities for post-secondary support for Métis students has never been greater. 
Since its inception in 2008, a total of $5.4 million has been awarded to a total of 1,515 Métis Scholars. The Métis Scholar Awards provide support for our students in years one, two, or three. For more information or if you have any questions, you're always welcome to um, visit one of our employment centers or ask our drivers at the mobile units, Bernie and Brian, I have a shout out here. And with that, I would like to introduce our Associate Director, Sharon Sawchuk, and she'll speak more to you about our training and research mandates. Please help me welcome Sharon Sawchuk. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, before I get started, I was sitting with our colleagues and noticed we all dressed in similar colors, but we didn't consult with each other on what we were wearing today. So that was interesting. Anyway, um, I'm always happy to talk about the training mandate. Uh, our staff work really hard out in the field. The training mandate is a department that delivers the Alberta Métis Education and Training Strategy. Um, our mandate is to provide opportunities for Alberta Métis to find employment through higher education, skills training, job search, and career decision making. So we get asked various questions, and this one here is, how can I access programs and services? Access to services are made available through 10 employment centers, two mobile units, and an online application process for post-secondary and apprenticeship training. This map demonstrates where our centers are located and throughout the province. And each center, there's usually a, a job coach or more, uh, an employment counselor or both, and depends on the size of the center. Did you know also we have an online service? So the online service is for people to access. There's a team of five employment counselors who assist people with their last two years uh, it last two semesters of a diploma, degree, or certificate program. These services also assist people attending apprenticeship training through, throughout their four terms of the apprenticeship right to journeyman. Our staff work with the people remotely through email and telephone, and, and they do a really great job. And uh, last year, they assisted 346 people to complete post-secondary education in various diploma, degree, or uh, certificate program, along with apprenticeships. Then we have our other services uh, to access, and that's our mobile units. And uh, these two drivers travel uh, to more remote communities to provide services where we don't have an employment center. The two mobile units are fully equipped with internet, computers, and Rupert's Land staff to assist with job search, career decision making, and skills training. Bernie and Brian, our mobile operators, travel five days a week and also attend community events when people invite them. And I think they've been to all the regions at various events these gentlemen provide service and are always ready to go and they enjoy their community. So I'd like to thank Brian and Bernie for all their hard work. The next question is a lot of times people are wanting to know how do we, how do we support people through in our services? So one of the questions, and it's, it's been what we've seen over the last while with people being unemployed or possibly employment threatened due to the low, uh, the bad economy, the downturn in the economy. So this question is, I have been employed in the same industry for 20 years. I'm recently unemployed. How can we help you? So we can help through uh, 
job coaches and employment counselors who provide counseling, job search workshops, and techniques to gain employment, career decision making, and access to training programs or funding to enhance the person's skills to compete in the labor market. So these are a couple of our job coaches and uh, they help out uh, people. Our job coaches ha have also gone to the point where they take a person's resume, they go to an employer and say, hey, I've got this client who's really got these skills, why don't you hire them? These two gentlemen that I'm just about to show you here, um, they access the service to re-enter or enhance their skills. Uh, one of the gentlemen in the top corner was a heavy equipment operator. He had some difficulties continuing in that job. So our staff worked with him, got him some training, and now he's a heavy equipment operator instructor at a college. The other gentleman was employment threatened. He also was having trouble. He worked his way up the industry and uh, but realized in the economy he needed to get better skills to support that, more technical training. And so now he's a petroleum technician and working in the oil field. So it's been helpful. If you want to see other success stories, we have them uh, on our section in our annual report, 24, pages 24 to 37. And there's many other success stories that, but we have many that we can't share because we just have too many. The next one is, uh, is another program that we designed and it's our entrepreneurial program that provides people with the opportunity to develop the skills and knowledge to develop their own business or also to enhance the diversity of their current business to compete in the labor market. We have a great partnership with Mike Ivey's team at Apatokasin and also Ballad Consulting and they work individually with, uh, with people to start their own businesses or deliver workshops. So through those workshops and uh, uh, individual support, we've, we helped 35 people start their own businesses this year, which or last year, which we think is pretty good. The next one is uh, people ask us, what do you do for youth? And do youth have programs uh, through uh, the Métis Training to Employment? And we do, we have, the, we have various programs. The Job Shadow Program is a summer program that supports um, the youth to look at various occupations, career decision making, and learn some work skills. The other one is a wilderness tourism program where again they learn some horsemanship, guiding, and leadership skills. Uh, they learn how to uh, start businesses within a tourism uh, situation. Then we have also our summer employment program which is a wage subsidy program for so students who are returning back to school to get uh, a job for the summer. And so we work with various employers and nonprofit organizations to provide employment for students in the summer. And this year I'm pleased to say we had 191 students access that support and they were able to find employment and will be returning to school. The next slide is uh, something we're very pleased about and we've been doing this in the last few years where the downturn of economy has been so bad that it's difficult for people to find employment. But um, we were able to uh, assist uh, 1,093 Métis people to find employment, return to school or self-employment. We've well exceeded our 750 targets that were assigned to us by the federal government in our agreement. 
So we've been doing that over the last few years. So we're really pr proud of that. I'm going to move on to our research mandate. So our research mandate um, is a partnership with the University of Alberta. And the research center, Rupert's Land Center for Métis Research is unique in the country. There's no other academic Métis research center like this in Canada. As a think tank, Rupert's Land Center for Métis Research validates policy positions, knowledge, the support, and knowledge that supports the development of the work to allow a Métis voice to be heard by politicians, government, and all levels, at all levels. And through this research, Rupert's Land Center for Métis Research helps Rupert's Land uh, develop business cases for programs and funding so we can better serve our community. I had a little video to show you, but uh, it didn't work. So. But Rupert's Land Institute is a partner with the U of A, and the Rupert's Land Center of uh, Métis Research is located in the Native Studies Department, and they do have a booth here, and please stop in and find out more about uh, what they do and how we partner together. We have, uh, what does re we research? There's four different uh, examples here. The one report, there's two reports actually around labor market research. And that is one of the things that we use through the uh, Métis Training to Employment to develop programming and help people find employment to um, bridge the gap or lower the gap uh, within various occupations. We also, uh, there was a report written about the Métis Education K-12 policy discussion paper, and that helped us set up the strategy for the education mandate that's specific to developing K-12 resources and other areas related to education. The bridging gap, the bridging the Aboriginal education gap in Alberta is a, is a a report that's really specific to how Indigenous programming has helped uh, the Métis community to be part of the workforce. So all these reports are online on our website and if, you, if you're interested in having a look at some of the research that we do, they're very interesting and they're um, informative. Thank you, I'm going to introduce Mr. Gladju, our CEO. Thanks, Sharon. It's quite loud back there. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm good. Um, first of all, I want to thank Sharon and Lisa and Mark for their presentations. And just Spicer over here, Francis Dume over here, Joe Blyan out there, Louis Belrose is out there, and of course, our dear elder that we use for the Alberta Métis Education Council, Ms. Betty. Um, so, I, I, I know that was a lot of information to digest in the last 30 minutes. I sincerely hope you have found that information useful. And if it doesn't necessarily apply to you, I hope that you'll take the information back to either your family members or to your community and share that information with those that you know who are interested in either accessing the labor market or want to pursue an education. For a brief moment, uh, I know you're all going through the annual report and you have a very good reason to do that because I know there's a big screen TV and a waiting for you. Um, I want to refer to uh, Sharon's presentation, and I don't have the screen here, but uh, I think on page 25 of your annual report, uh, Sharon pointed out the success rates that we had with employment results 
over the past year. Um, and the reason why I want to I want to comment on that particular uh, slide in, uh, is the fact that I think you all know that uh, over the years we've always presented on the employment stats that we generate as a result of our programs. Essentially, at the end of the day, employment employment results are are our bread and butter in terms of how we operate and how we uh, conduct our business at Rufus Land Institute in terms of also how we report to government. Um, and I, I believe that Sharon mentioned that the Métis Train to Employment Program surpassed its assigned annual targets. And I want to highlight the point because this success came at a time when the province was losing thousands of jobs, as you all know. Uh, the province has been in a bit of a tank uh, over the past uh, couple of years. And we've seen the headlines. I mean, you see the headlines that tell us that we have not seen as much change in minimum wage growth since 2009. Uh, and that Canada, of course, as you all know, uh, recently, if you read the paper, has shed as much as 20, 27,000 jobs in the last week alone, while at the same time, we saw the employment rate rise by 5.7%. So how is that possible? On the one hand, you have, you're losing jobs, and on the other hand, you have an employment rate that's going up. Uh, this, I think, when you take a look at our employment results, where we surpassed uh, our annual employment targets, is an interesting phenomena for Rupert Land Institute because while this is happening in the economy, we have not only managed to reach our annual targets for employed results, but we have gone beyond that target by 20%. <laughs> Even more weird is the fact that Métis tend to fall into industry sectors that offer lower wage positions, and we are generally the first to go when the economy hits the tank. So how is it possible then that RLI can report positive employment outcomes while the economy is in a slowdown? Well, I like to believe that the answer lies in the fact that we have highly trained and dedicated staff that are immersed in the community and in the business sectors. And they know how to build relationships and employment partnerships. The secret, I believe, is in the knowledge on where to look in the hidden job market and, in, of course, ultimately in community involvement. And that, of course, ultimately is working with industry. That's where I, I like to believe is where our experienced job coaches come in. I believe our job coaches have done a remarkable job for us. And we have the client testimonials to prove it. And that ultimately is my point on that particular slide. I'm up here to give you uh, some comments on what lies ahead for Rupert Land Institute. I'll be really brief. I think you all know by now, Aaron Barner pointed out that the MA has signed a recognition and self-government agreement with the Government of Canada. So in anticipation of all this, last year, uh, we, we, we of course always do our strategic planning. Our board goes into a uh, strat planning mode, usually in the fall. But Rupert Land Institute is, of course, going through a process of restructuring to accommodate Métis Nation government services. And by that we mean we're looking at ways to integrate our wraparound services into our programming. We're working towards a service delivery structure that may become ultimately a ministry or a crown corporation of the new Métis Nation government. And of course, as part of that, we're looking at changing roles of staff and redesigning our org chart to, to ensure we're on pace with that. Uh, other things we're working on, of course, is RLI succession. As you know, some of us are getting uh, long on a tooth, my, me included. And sooner or later, we're gonna have a changing of the guard, so to speak, from the old to the new. So we're taking steps on our human resource front to accommodate new or enhanced services to the community. And of course, we're looking at ways on how we're going to absorb the brand new Métis Nation post-secondary program that uh, was presented to you on the screen, and a few others mentioned that in their presentations a while back. Um, that, of course, is going to add at least 70% uh, 70, 70 growth in terms of, our, of our, um, our financial side of things to RLI. And what that generally means is it's going to have a, a 
It's going to require a human resource base and ultimately a growth in programs and services available to the community. So that's, that's going to be something. In addition to that, you may have heard that Métis Nation has signed the Early Learning and Child Care um, Agreement with the Government of Canada. Métis Nation, by and large, is, is, is uh, providing the oversight on that agreement, but from that, Rupert Land Institute will be accessing uh, a large part of those resources to not only accommodate the uh, child care costs that we have been enduring under our labor market program over the years, but also at the same time to look at other ways that we can conduct and initiate early learning initiatives for Métis children. Uh, you, you also heard that we've been exploring um, how we're going to get into um, uh, uh, um, implementing our Indigenous Languages um, program and the revitalization of Métis languages, like Michip, for example, uh, and absorbing that into our K-12 professional development resources. And in addition, uh, ultimately, we're wondering how we're going to accommodate all of the students that, that we are hoping will want to approach Rupert Land Institute for services. And we're, we're, we're going to be setting up what we're going to call Métis Students Association, where anyone at, at the grade 10 level, grade 10, grade 11, grade 12, someone who is not in high school but is considering returning to school or is considering going, going to school down the road, any one of these individuals, whether you're 15 or 64 years of age, if somewhere down the road you, if you're considering going to school, we would encourage you to join the Métis Students Association because during that period of time, while you're waiting for um, your opportunity to, to actually return to school or go to school, that you can access uh, M&A services or on the registry services to get an M&A &A membership card and whatever, whatever other connections you need to make with the community because you know that when you come to apply for services and when you go to our post-secondary uh, institution to uh, institutions to apply for endowments, there's always that requirement. They want to know how are you connected to the community. So if you are a part of the Métis Students Association, you will be connected to the community and ultimately you will graduate from that into our, our service programs where you'll access services and when you come out of training or you come out of schooling, you can then join the RLI Alumni Association and then give back to the community, hopefully. Ultimately then, under the, uh, the species of what we're calling lifelong learning, uh, what this really means for RLI in the years ahead, of course, is that we're going to have a wider range of services available to the people, all the way from preschool to K-12, to post-secondary, and of course, ultimately, our bread and butter program, where you have um, our Métis training to employment. So, if you're in high school, or you're thinking about going back to school, or you're returning to school, or you simply want to upskill your skill set in a workplace, we want you to think about RLI as an option. We want you to imagine your future. Bring your dream to us and let us help you get ahead of the future. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, uh, RLI, Rupert Sline Institute, Métis Center of Excellence. Uh, Guido's going to plug the, the prizes again, uh, but before we get into that, are there any questions? We have a question at the front. There's a microphone at the end. Um, I think Rupert Sloan Institute uh, is something we should all be proud of. It's an example of what happens when Métis design and deliver something by Métis, for Métis, accountable to Métis. Um, they have pamphlets, they have information packages on, on your tables, and I'll say, with what Rupert Sloan's doing within the nation, um, there goes the microphone, uh, now is a heck of a time to be a student or thinking about being a student. So um, thanks a lot, Rupert Sloan Institute. We have a question at the yeah. microphone. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. First of all, thank you, Drew Persan, for that report. I apologize 
for all the noise in the back there that we couldn't ever, we had a hard time hearing. Uh, these reports are very important to us. That's what we're here for, to see what's happening in our METI nation during the past year. I, I ask you, please keep down the roar when the reports are being, are being done. And thank you. I have some, two questions. Lauren, first, I had talked to you about two very important, <coughs> very important in our, to our community. One was, uh, the first one was security. How we want training uh, uh, for security. Angie, can I just interrupt you for a quick second? Can we hold off on, on serving food until the presentation is done and we have a chance to bless the food, please? Yeah. And also, uh, as is customary, uh, the elderly and, and disabled folks usually eat first, okay? So can you just hold off on serving the food, please? The second one was for uh, <coughs> carpentry. We got buildings going all over Canada and we don't have enough carpenters. There are some, but don't have the right papers. Is, have you any plans, any ideas of how these people can get their, their, the wages that they deserve? Thank you for that uh, question, Angie. And uh, we, I know that you and I have spoke about security training uh, the last time we met this uh, in July. And uh, we haven't had a lot of opportunity to develop that at this point, but we will um, look at that. I have kept that in my back of my mind. And I wasn't aware about the carpentry, but I certainly will uh, talk to you more about that so we can arrange some uh, training because I do believe uh, Grand Prairie College does have some trade programs. Thank you. I believe in Rupert's land because I believe me tea happened me tea and you guys are doing that job. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, looks like people are hungry. Uh, there's a big lineup. Uh, Francis, uh, can you bless the food? Francis, Francis Dume, can you bless the food? If everybody can stand. Folks, the one that's got a plate already, please don't eat. Let's say a prayer. Let's thank the Creator for everything that He does for me, every, every, everything that He does for us. You know, let's thank Him for all the good things that's happening. And let's bless this food with a prayer. And do not forget the people that left before us. Don't forget those people invite him to eat with you. So, and I will ask the Creator to bless all of us, all you people here, all your nice people that sound that way, I think. With that, we'll say the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hey, hey, do tempting, merci. All right, thank you very much, uh, Francis. Again, I'll just reiterate, folks, uh, we've all been to assemblies before, we know how the process goes with food. 
please, uh, if, if you need help getting food, uh, stay seated, put your hand up. We have, uh, are there people from the youth conference here? Are there youth here? You guys serve the elders, please, and serve up uh, people that are uh, uh, disabled and have mobility issues. So let's get them fed first, and then we'll make our, our way through the line, okay? So elders and disabled first. Young people, get in line, get to the front, and serve the people with their hand up that need help, okay? Thank you. Also, uh, there's been a lost cell phone. It's a Samsung, okay? If you can just keep your eye out for a phone, look around you, do a courtesy. This is, it's his phone, okay? All right, thanks. 